I have the wonderful uh, opportunity to uh, introduce Therese to you this evening. Therese received her BA from Carleton College and her MS and PhD in Cognitive Psychology from Carnegie Mellon. She was also awarded a prestigious postdoctoral fellowship with the Center for Neural Basis of Cognition. Therese was the founding director for the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning and has served as the director from 2004 until 2010. Drawing upon her background in cognitive science, she has spent the past decade helping smart faculty make better decisions about their teaching. Her first book, Teaching What You Don't Know, was published by Harvard Press in 2009. Um, anecdotally, uh, she gave us a sort of more um, you know, regular person bio. Um, and, and I think the best part about your regular person bio is that she is an addicted to weight gain. And that many of her colleagues uh, blame various amounts of weight gain on her desire to produce chocolatey type baking. Um, she's also an author of a blog, which I think is kind of a cool thing. She's uh, author of Gluten-Free Happy Place. So if you're looking for gluten-free ideas, I'm guessing you'll find some really fun ones there. Um, Therese has allowed us to give away a copy of her book, and I'm going to use my infamous random numbers generator, which is how I get students to talk to me, to give away a book. All right? And the book is going to go to participant number nine, who is? Christy Bradburn. And I bet, bet you can get that signed by Therese later. It's not ours. So without much uh, more to say, I'm going to turn the floor over to Therese, and I'm just going to thank you again for coming and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much, Carol. All right. How's that sound? Can you hear me? Yes? Oh, there it is. Now, got it. Great. It is such a treat to be here. Thank you so much. I know it's a big deal to take time out on a Tuesday night in the middle of the semester. So I am delighted to be here and we're going to have a good time. Um, people expect different things from a keynote or a plenary. Some people want really big ideas. Other people want something concrete, practical that they can use next week. I'm going to try to do both. I'm going to try to give some big ideas as well as things that people need right away. And as I met some faculty tonight, I met some people who are brand new teachers and they're really hoping that they can use things right away. So that would be my goal. Um, can I get a quick show of hands? How many, for how many people in the room, your primary responsibility is teaching? I'm guessing it's most people. Okay, we've got a few. We've got a couple who are probably administrative roles and other things. Okay, good. All right, so that's good because most of my examples are around teaching. All right, so we're going to talk about skillful teaching at the edge of your expertise. And um, before we do that, can we just give a quick hand for Michael and Carol and Kara and everybody who organized this? Thank you. They did. They've been just, they've just been fantastic. I was telling Kara, this is my favorite place to come now because you guys are so good at hosting. <laughs> I've come twice this year because you're so good at this. I don't know if that's Southern hospitality or what. All right. We're going to talk about um, teaching on the edge of your expertise. My, my book is titled Teaching What You Don't Know. And this, this was the first cover when it first came out in 2009. And um, they came out with a paperback just last year in 2012. And when they came out with a the paperback, they changed the cover to this, and, um, and that told me that someone at Harvard University Press had read the book. <laughs> because if you're teaching on the edge of your expertise, this is what your life feels like, not this, right? It's not happy blue, I and mean, it may feel like a tightrope, but it's not happy blue cloud. This is, this is you feel overwhelmed, but the stack is never going down, right? So, um, here are my hopes for tonight. I always try to ask three questions, and my hope is that by the end of the evening, you will have made some progress on each of these three. No definitive answers because they're pretty broad. Oh, that's strange. That's a Mac PC thing, I think, the one, two, one. <laughs> Could be one, two, three. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. Well, it'll, be, it'll be fun to watch what happens to the other bullet points later, right? <laughs> um, when I've been to, uh, for those of you who give keynotes and plenaries, a, a favorite structure um, that you may also use, and I'm going to use tonight, is the what, so what, now what. So that's another way of thinking about what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about what's the issue, so what, why should we care, and now what. And what are the implications of that? That's kind of that last one. And my hope is just that you leave here energized and engaged. Right? That you're excited about this rather than doing it as an onerous thing that you have to do. Because I sure love it. All right, since most of you are teachers, I'd like you, or at least have a primary responsibility this evening, I'd like you to write down the answer to this. And um, hopefully, does everybody have the handouts now? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, if we got, we got a few in the back who need some, can, we, can somebody help them out? Great. We got one over here, this is one. Excellent. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, I'd like you to write down your 
answer to that. The first thing that comes to mind, on my very best class days, I blank and my students blank. And that can be just broadly thinking. Any kind of class, what's your best for you and for your students? Teaching. 
not here, even though this is where we want to be. And the reason that this might be the sweet spot is we're aware, you're more aware of what's hard when you're in that conscious competence spot. And so you can better relate to where the students are going to struggle. But, of course, once we master something, we, it becomes easier for us. Any questions about that model? Okay. So, with that in mind, I'm going to talk about that sweet spot of conscious competence because I think that's where a lot of us will find ourselves. It's not as comfortable as the unconscious competence, right? Because unconscious competence things come really easily to us. We've got this huge literature and terms come easily. But we want to talk about teaching on the edge of one's expertise, and that's on the other side of the um, spectrum. Lots of different definitions for this. Um, it could be, uh, in addition to this new material, it could be something that you haven't had to yourself since you were a sophomore, right? You'll we'll often find yourself teaching those kind of classes. It could be interdisciplinary. It could be a new application of something that you already knew, but a new application. It could be that you're doing the QEP. You have to now think about an ethical aspect that you hadn't thought about for your courses. Lots of different places where this could happen. And the term that I think, as far as I can tell, I introduced is the notion of a content novice. So, not if you're with me. You know what a content expert is? Yes, content experts. You're probably all content experts in some field. Content novice, right, is the notion that you could be an expert teacher, but this topic is new to you. All right? So content novice, and you could you could have spent literally decades becoming an expert teacher, but now this topic is new to you. I think that's an important distinction because when we think about being a novice teacher, that's well, we're far past that, right? But you could be a content. I don't mean new things. <laughs> when I first started researching this book and I would talk about it with people, they would insist, no, but I'm really organized. I, I, I spend so much time preparing for class, and I'm not saying that you're not prepared. If anything, I found a lot of people who are teaching on the edge of their expertise were over-preparing, right? Oh, they were learning more than they could ever possibly teach in class just so they felt comfortable coming in. Okay. In a few minutes, I'm going to have you talk with your neighbor, but I need to define, I want to give you some examples of teaching on the edge of your expertise, some more concrete examples. Um, what's that? Oh, it's not. No, you don't, you don't have all of these. Um, I'd be happy to provide the slides for you, just in terms of saving paper. I just gave you the one I thought you might want right now. And I might have misjudged, so you can tell me if I should include this next time. Um, I interviewed 28 people for my book originally, and then I've interviewed many more. So these are some examples from people that I've interviewed. When I was interviewing, um, I interviewed a person who teaches veterinary medicine. And when I was talking with her about teaching on the edge of her expertise, the example that she was very excited to talk about was this. Her specialty is horses, large animals, particularly horses. And for her, I kid you not, teaching on the edge of her expertise was horse nutrition. Which to me, I was like, you have a luxurious life. <laughs> and that's teaching. But, but she said the risks are very high. Right? You have a thoroughbred, if you give them too much iodine, what does that mean? Right? So huge, huge, huge risks involved. So for her, that was a high risk issue. I just want to point out that that's one edge, one boundary of teaching on the edge of your expertise. And another person that I talked with, again, not kidding, <laughs> this person is described in my book, um, trained as an engineer, and this faculty member found himself teaching the history of fashion. <laughs> because of a misunderstanding, <laughs> and did it, and then it was good enough that they kept having him teach it. Now, this person was in a textiles college, so these were all courses within, right, textile engineer to fashion design, so it's not as far a stretch, but still, for this person, it was a huge stretch. Teaching Coco Chanel, right? <laughs> Think about most engineers that you know. No. <laughs> right. So anyway, I want to give you the range, okay? And you may fall somewhere in there. And this is a nice true story. It's, it's captured in the book. Kevin Otis is down at Elon University, which I guess isn't that far from here in North Carolina. And um, I interviewed Kevin several times over the course of my book. One of my favorite stories from him. He's a tenure track professor at Elon, and it's required that all all tenure track and tenured faculty have to teach a Gen Ed class called Global Studies 110. Now, big title, and there are you know eight objectives for the course. And most, and he's a theater professor, assistant professor, most theater professors would just teach them global drama, right? They would look at drama traditions across the world. He did not want to do that. He wanted to push himself. And he decided he would, this would be a chance for him to kind of teach books that he'd only ever read on airplanes before. So he taught, okay, guns, germs, and steel, yes, Freakonomics, 
He did teach, he did teach 12th and 9th. He did. <laughs> and he said that was his worst teaching, as it turns out. Um, but in any case, so he taught these things that were outside of his expertise to, to give global view. So here's, here's the specific class. I think this was the second week of classes. They had just watched a movie about global warming. Um, you can conveniently guess which movie that was. And <laughs> they, it's a class of 18 freshmen. These are all freshmen in this class. Um, they did the circle. They're, they're sitting around in a circle to talk about the movie. And Kevin says, a famous, I'm going to paraphrase Kevin, but he basically said, a famous philosopher once said that throughout human history, people have tolerated a lot of discomfort. And they will tolerate discomfort and tolerate it. And at some point, there's a threshold that's reached, and they suddenly change their behavior. But the point I want you to remember is that people don't change gradually. They just suddenly reaches a point in the discomfort they can't tolerate it anymore. So Kevin says that he's about to go on, and a student, a freshman, remember, a couple of seats to his left, raises her hand, and she said, I think that was Rousseau, and then she quoted it from memory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, Kevin had only read the paraphrased version of a famous philosopher once said, right? <laughs> and he was so panicked. Because here he was being shown up by a freshman who, he's not even sure if she's right. He's not sure if it's Rousseau. He's not sure if that's true, the quote that she gave, right? And he said in the moment, he's like, at best I could have spelled Rousseau on the board. <laughs> that was it. That's as far as he could go. So he, he thought, he, he immediately became embarrassed and he moved on and couldn't say anything with respect to the quote. This is the moment we live in terror of, right? That our students will know more than us and maybe... The bigger fear is that then we will be expected to parlay with them at that level, right? And, and, and they might have a question that we can't answer and they know far more than we do. Chances are your students know more about something than you do. Let's face it, right? I mean, we're gonna, that's the reality. In some <coughs> field, maybe it's obscure and you don't care about it, but they probably know something <laughs> more than you know. So, lots of different reasons for people teaching <coughs> outside of their expertise. I just want to give you some things that will make it comfortable because I'm going to ask you to talk about teaching outside of your expertise. Lots of different reasons. And I find this is one of my favorite Fred Rogers quotes, <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Um, I do find that if we talk about things, it makes it much more manageable. So I'm going to have you talk with the neighbor. Before you talk, I want you to write down two topics. Or they could be courses. So it could be a particular topic within a course or an entire course that you either have taught or you could imagine yourself teaching. It would be a legitimate thing that could be asked of you. One that's in the center of your expertise, your sweet spot, that course that just falls beautifully in your expertise. And then one that is uncomfortably on the edge of your expertise, but that might be a realistic thing that you would be asked to teach. So take a moment to write that down, either a topic or an entire course. Did you say every course? <laughs> Yes, and, and I have to tell you, 
at the end of this talk, that will not go away. It's going to be a lot of work. Yes, it is a lot of work. Yes. Anything else? Provide its example. So that if your example doesn't work, and they say, could you give us another example? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. On the one hand, you, you like the idea that they're so engaged that they like, I think I get it, but can I have a second example? That's hard. You're right. Yes. So on the one hand, you want to prep multiple examples, but you can't do that for every concept. It's totally overwhelming. Very good point. Let's switch to advantages. And he puts his hand <laughs> Yes. I'm all about the advantages. I was Please. talking about this topic at lunch today. I think that it puts us in the state, in the situation where the student is. I think the biggest danger of college teaching is that when we teach from our expertise, we often teach to our expertise. And especially with regard to undergraduate students, Many of them are not only not experts, they don't desire to be experts. They desire to be informed human beings. And so, yes. to me, the most refreshing thing about the various different scenarios where you were highlighting that we could be teaching at the edge of our expertise yes. is our state of mind as opposed to where the students are. Yes, exactly. You're at least on that model. You're not way over there in the unconscious competence, right? You're a little bit closer. But also, the examples that make sense to you are probably examples that are more likely to make sense, hopefully, right? You're not going to be interested in as arcane details as you might in your specialty. We are good at arcane, obscure details as <laughs> faculty. That's a, thank you so much. Others, another advantage. Where did you capture it? Oh, yes. I got to say that it was not my area of expertise, and, and I was teaching for a person who was ill, so I got maybe the sympathy vote, and then I found that honesty and transparency worked very well for me that semester. Oh, good. Honesty and transparency with the students? Yes. Very nice. Okay, that's often something people wonder about. We're going to come back to that point. Your name is? Karen. All right. Well, hopefully we've established the what. What do I mean by teaching on the edge of your expertise? Can I get a show of hands? How many people have at least once in their career taught on the edge of their expertise? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's very funny. When I first, um, when this book first came out, I'm not going to, there's someone I highly respect um, who's a, a, a high up administrator in a very large state university. Who, when this book came out, she contacted me and she said, you were able to find 28 university faculty who had And I had to say, I'll bet we can find 28 faculty in most of your departments. <laughs> but this is such, this is not, has, it's so rarely talked about that it's not seen as an issue. And so we're moving on to the so what, from what to so what. So what does this mean for students and what does this mean for faculty? It, it didn't get mentioned in the short time we spent on the advantages, but often a concern, although it comes out of the examples, is that will our students, students learn as much if we're teaching on the edge of our expertise? We don't have as much to offer, right? We don't have as rich a repertoire to draw from. And then what does it mean for faculty? We, we did get into some of those. It's a lot more work. And we may not be as interested. All right. How do content novices teach? If you do a lip search for how for content novices and you know research, there, there's not much. But there is some really fascinating research on organizational behavior, which is an area of business, and they look at who makes the best trainers, who makes the best teachers in industry. So that's where I've turned to for a lot of this research. So, good news. Empirically, people who are content novices, people teaching on the edge of their expertise, do several things better than people who are in that unconscious competence, the real experts who've been doing this for a really long time. In general, they're much more accurate on how long a task will take. They're better at understanding first-timers' mistakes, right? Just the point you were making. You're right there. You know what's hard. This is fascinating. This is a neat empirical study. I can't remember now. This is electrical engineering students. But what they were looking at is the type of, they actually had people teach. They did, they did a recording of teachers, and then they had someone evaluate who didn't know how much knowledge the teacher had, and they had this person rate the quality of the teaching. So they were giving a 10-minute teaching sample, right? And what was fascinating is the people who had just learned the material, literally had just learned it to do this teaching, offered much more concrete explanation of what the students needed to understand. Um, in fact, with the experts, 90% of the experts left out a critical detail that students needed to solve the problem. They knew the problem, the teacher knew what problem they had to solve, and still 90% of the experts left out that crucial detail. Whereas all 
of the content novices included it, right? Because they understood you need to know this to solve this problem, because they were right there with the students. They offer more concrete explanation. And you're more likely to use student-friendly examples. You're not going to use, if you're talking about political elections, you're not going to talk about Grover Cleveland, right? You're not going to talk about something recent, right? If you're not an expert in elections. The bad news. And this is this is the other side of this research study. Um, the experts use more abstract concepts, not surprisingly. If you're an expert, you have you're more interested in the abstract concepts and you know how it transfers to different problems. The not content novices used fewer abstract concepts, and that made it harder for students when they were taught by those novices to transfer it to new situations, right? The abstract concept allows you to move across problems. So if you're a content novice, the lesson is you're probably going to have to spend a little more time working on the abstract issues because you're going to be inclined not to talk about them. And that makes perfect sense, right? You're going to talk about the concrete things, the things that really make sense to you. So the extra effort to put in, you're going to put in in addition to the examples, which I like that one, but also think about the abstract if you can. I know that's the uncomfortable place, but that's the place where we'll put in a little more time. And also the students have the most trouble with the abstract stuff, right? So that's also more value added. All right. This is where I want to give you some dramatic. Oh, there we go. All right. I had to check my notes. What was coming up. <laughs> so, as I was interviewing faculty, one of the fun things for me to be thinking about is um, how faculty were categorized differently. Were there, were there categories that were emerging for the faculty? Um, and I, I came up with three categories. These are just affectionate terms for them, but you'll, you'll hopefully see yourself in one of these three categories. So we have the poised and the confident, is what I call them. And the poised and the confident were faculty who, when I talked with them about teaching outside of their expertise, they said, I love this. I, in fact, I will volunteer in my department. When my department chair says we need someone to teach this new course, chances are I'm going to raise my hand. Right? That's, and, and, they, and they go in, and they, ask, they say it's a lot of hard work, but they go in and they, they enjoy it. And then we get to the undecided but untroubled. These folks weighed the pros and the cons. They, they would tell me about how much they enjoyed it, but they weren't the first to volunteer at the time, right? They, they were being careful about how much work it was going to be involved. And then we have the strained and the anxious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I presented these all as women so, because I didn't find any gender differences in terms of how it was only a sample of 28, but it wasn't like the men were more poised and confident than women. It was um, a whole mix across them. The strained and the anxious were the people, when I interviewed them, they would say, can I, can I get some of your notes, like, next week? <laughs> Often they had been up till 2 in the morning, the night before, up in class. They were really overwhelmed. They did not enjoy this experience. They wanted it to be over. Um, but they were, they, they were willing to tell me what they needed and um, what, what wasn't helping them. But they weren't finding many things that weren't helping them. So my hope is... To, get is to help as many of you at least move to this, if not this, right? If you find yourself here. And what I learned is some people could be both. You could be poised and confident in one course outside of your expertise and strained and anxious in another. For some, it was a grad class versus undergrad. There were lots of different ways people differ in this. So, we're going to pull lessons from the poised and the confident. This was one of the fascinating things that I heard. Um, so, you just finished the book, you got to teach it on Monday. Are you going to do active learning or are you going to lecture? What do you think you're going to do? I'm going to lecture. <laughs> Everybody agreed on this, even the voice and the confident. I, would, I talked to some people who primarily use active learning and they would admit, even though I love active learning, if I just learn the material, I'm going to lecture. So there's an irony in this, right? You're not the expert yet, right? And yet you're going to get up there and lecture. So why? Why? Control others? Comfort, habit, oh, habit, yeah. others. You can organize the materials. Yes, yes, you can organize the materials. You're like, I actually disagree with that. You disagree with it? Good. Completely, because yeah. um, I don't want to lecture on something that I just read. I, it, it, presumably, it's been assigned to students as well. Yes, it's much easier to come up with a series of discussion questions. Good. And the interesting ideas that you think of, the issues that you think the book raises. You can then bring to the class, and then you can actually have a conversation about it. You don't have to pretend to be the expert on the material. I completely agree with you. That's what I would think would happen. But what that's I, what I that's what you do. That's great. I wish I wish more people felt that way. 
what I heard was time and time again people saying instead, like, I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it, right? And I think a big part of it was control. Another part was they only knew what they had in their lecture notes, the notes that they took that they were reading, so that's what they were going to speak from. But I found this a fascinating irony, right? They became the sage on the stage when they were not at all <laughs> the sage <laughs> that they might be in some of their topics. All right. So what were some of the strategies from the poise and the confidence? There were several I want to share with you. And then we're going to get into really concrete and nitty-gritty. But these are more overarching themes that I saw in the poise and the confidence that I didn't tend to see in the strength and the anxious. Okay? And by the way, age didn't make a difference for a number of years in teaching experience. I interviewed one person who taught for over 30 years, and he hates, he hates teaching on the edge of his expertise. He's in a small two-person department, so he does it a lot in order to offer the whole. Um, in any case, he was not happy. And then I, taught with, I, I interviewed someone who was in her first year of teaching, and she loved teaching on the edge of her expertise. So you, you get the whole range. So what were some of the strategies that I think that, that we can have some control over? So one, take control of the choices you can. So a mistake that the strained and the anxious I heard doing, I, would, I didn't realize this one was a mistake until I heard it again and again, and that was people would often take the syllabus from the person who had taught the course before in the department, or they'd find one online, and they'd update it with the dates and the calendar information, and they, they made it their own. And this made them feel confident that, well, this is someone else's, it worked for someone else, right? However, <laughs> it put them on really shaky ground because they didn't have any ownership over this, right? So one thing to do, it's very smart to look at several syllabi. What I advise people to do is look at four or five syllabi and then create one of your own. You may that borrow more heavily from one than the others, but make it your own. If there are policies, if you prefer papers to exams, do that. Do things that will make you feel as confident as possible. So that was a fascinating thing that, that that people thought was going to make them feel empowered, and instead it stripped them. Particularly when students had questions about you know, some policy on page six, and the instructors like page six. Oh gosh, right? <laughs> and I'll look at the syllabus. What did I say on page six? <laughs> All right, this was huge. The poised and the confident, much more often than the strained and the anxious, would tell someone that they were still learning. Now it's controversial as to whether they told their students. We can talk about that. But what was important was that they told someone, typically a peer, that they were still learning. And that took away the sense of the imposter syndrome. Somebody knew that this was hard, that they were doing this, and that reduced the anxiety that they were the only one. I talked with one really strained and anxious, anxious person who was co-teaching a class, and she hadn't even told her the person she was co-teaching with because he was tenured and she wasn't. Tremendously, you can imagine how stressful that was, right? Her prep for class every time, even when she wasn't going to lecture or teach, she was overwhelmed. So, talking with someone about the fact that you're still learning. As to whether or not you tell the students you're still learning, this is an interesting issue. Um, what I heard from people was that, particularly women in male dominated disciplines and faculty of color, didn't tend to tell their students that they were teaching something that they were still learning because they already felt that they were one down in the eyes of the students because they were, they were not seen as authority figures. Um, but there were some people like, I interviewed Beverly Daniel Tatum, who's an African-American woman, who would find ways to tell her students. And she did it in a very clever way. What she said, and this captures what you were saying, Sherry, earlier, is she has a policy. Every class, she goes into her class and says, if I'm successful today, you're going to learn something, and so am I. Every class she goes, and she doesn't teach anymore because she's president. But she used to say that every class, and that was her way of being able to say, I never thought of it that way. But that allowed her to be always in the constant learning mode. Talk with a content expert. This falls into the tell someone you're still learning, but, but sometimes a content expert can be an old faculty member of yours, right? Someone who might have taught this class before. They don't have to be the, the world expert, but someone who might have taught this before. Talk with them about what's hard, what do students, what examples help students learn. And think past knowledge dispensers. Now, nobody used that language, okay, in my interviews. Nobody said, oh, I'm a knowledge dispenser. Um, <laughs> I like this image. Um, but I heard it again and again in the strain and the anxious that they would talk about when students ask a question and I don't know. Um, I've, I've read the text, but sometimes students, graduate students, will have notes about something in the appendix. Um, they can feel this sense that like, if there was something that was asked, they had to dispense it. They had to be ready to shoot out the gun ball, right? Um, and that was a very stressful role to be in. Whereas the police and the anxious had a very different view. They would talk about their roles as 
when I would ask them about their role in the classroom, they would say things like, my role is to teach students to be a good biologist, to be a good educator, whatever it might be. Or it might be, my role is to teach them to ask, my role is to teach them to ask better questions. But they had, they had broader views, does that make sense? As opposed to just knowing my role is to, to know more than they do. All right. So now I'm going to get into some nitty gritty. I wonder if, by the way, we, we've left time at the end for questions. So if there are clarification, clarification questions, please ask them. But we're going to have good time at the end for some q &A. Now I want to get into some nitty gritty because I've given enough talks at enough universities and I know what tends to surface for people. Workload and time management, right? Like I said, I can't completely take this away. How much time is the issue? Um, favorite strategy that I've heard is asking three questions at the beginning of class. I did that at the beginning of this. Here are three questions you should be able to answer by the end of this unit, right? So that's a strategy you can take in class. You say, here are three questions you should be able to answer by the end of class. Now what's nice is that organizes your prep. If you start the prep that way, the typical way that people prep a class when it's new material is they start reading and they figure, okay, I need to talk about that, and they read some more, and oh, I need to talk about that. And then you're totally overwhelmed, right? How much are you going to get to cover? There's always still more to read. As opposed to if you can generate three questions that students should be able to answer, you've now narrowed what you need to do in terms of how to prep for the class. And then you tell students, here are the three questions, you put them on the board, or PowerPoint, whatever, Prezi, however you do that. And then you've now guided yourself and the students. Can you see any added advantages to that? Not only does it make it more manageable for your workload, but can you see other advantages? Yes. Yes. They, they feel like they learned what they were supposed to. And that means you're going to ask questions that relate to those three questions. You've now herded them a little bit. <laughs> they can still ask something random, but you've now focused the scope of their questions because they know they should be able to answer those things. So it really reigns in what students are going to ask questions about. It just makes you feel you quickly learn, oh, like this is I can manage this. I, I this, this is our domain. Questions? And also, it's really Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So, so it can help you then later. There's a big thing that takes a lot of time later than designing assessments, right? Very good. All right. Now you may be wondering, like, okay, but how do I come up with three questions? <laughs> right. Very nice, Therese, but <laughs> that's still a challenge. It is still a challenge. Um, this is actually taken from the Royal Air Force. I like it. Um, so the Royal Air Force used this in their training, um, and uh, it's the idea of this bullseye, the difference between must know, should know, and could know. So the idea is when you're trying to think about what am I going to talk about for a given class in a topic where I don't know very well, as you're reading, what are you thinking? I, these students must know this. That can help you design those three questions. They must know this. And that could be some, some term that you know is going to be important in other classes. It could be a concept that you know is core. Now, if it's outside of your expertise, often if it's in your department, the core concepts are often the same across courses. Does that make sense? It's often, right, the core concept, you know, um, in economics, um, uh, opportunity cost is an important concept across courses, even though you maybe teaching a class that's outside of your expertise to come back to a really core concept is helpful because they're going to need that in other courses as well. So what's the must know? And focus your three questions there. And then the should know broadens it out a bit. But this can often be an interesting discernment process. What's must know versus should know? If you want to try this, the first time you should try it in a class that you teach well. It's a really interesting exercise. And then try it in your course outside of your It could be knowledge or skill. It could be knowledge or skill, exactly, yes. Now we want to get into credibility. This is usually another big concern for people when they're teaching on the edge of their expertise is that they won't be credible, right? So this is a research, now this study's now getting a little dated, but I haven't found anything more recent that I like better. So this is pulling from research findings. Um, two of those answers are correct, according to this research study. What they did is they polled students about the behaviors that reduced instructor credibility, what, what bolstered credibility and what reduced credibility. 
So I want you to read these over, and then I'm going to ask you to vote for the two that you think are the correct answers. The top reasons that instructors lose credibility in class. So I'm going to read them over. Raise your hand when I. So the first one, how many people would say it's because the instructor doesn't know the students' names? A couple, good. B, lacks familiarity with the text. How many? Several. More. C, admits they found the material difficult. A couple. Just one or two. Um, reissues the syllabus. Okay. And does not rely on students' value days. Okay. So the correct answer is according to this study, the lacks familiarity with the text, which is what most people said, and does not rely on students' value days. Which is one of those things you're like, how is that credibility? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's not important to you, but it's still important to them, right? And I'm guessing this is probably gone up even more with us millennial students in <laughs> our classes. Yes. Um, <laughs> so this is this is helpful. What would be credible at a conference with a colleague is very different from what students find credible. So here, here's their full findings. So in terms of what which behaviors cause an instructor to have less credibility, really only two of them were directly about content. One was that you can't explain difficult concepts. This is great, right? Difficult concepts. The bad news as someone teaching on the edge of your expertise is if they're difficult for the students, they, they might be difficult for you. Unless it's a core concept in your discipline. But this is this is a place where it's worth spending some time. Those are probably abstract concepts and hard to understand. And then lacks familiarity with the text. You lose a lot of credibility if you say, um, oh yeah, no, I have I have no idea. And then somebody's like, yeah, it's on page 226. You need, you need to read the text. <laughs> when you're overwhelmed, just make sure you still read the text. But what was fascinating is, and there's gonna, this is going to continue, most of the things that students identified in terms of losing credibility had to do with the learning environment, not as much about content. So all three of these are about questions, right? Are you asking, do students understand? Um, questions about how well you can answer explanations about the policies in the syllabus. And the others, you lose credibility for these things, which chances are have nothing to do with your teaching outside of your expertise. They're just etiquette, right? You're arriving on time for class, reminding students of due dates of maybe more hand holding than etiquette. But this this affects perceptions of credibility. So the reason that I point this out is a lot of these are things that you could do even outside of your expertise, right? They're just good learning environment practices. The content stuff is harder, but at least it's more narrow than you thought. So since questions are so important, here's, I have a question for you. Why might you hesitate to ask students if they have questions? <laughs> you might not know. Is that just it? You might not know. Yeah? So it's uncomfortable to ask them. They might ask for another example. They might ask, can you explain it a different way? Right? And you have that one way, <laughs> that one cherished way that's the that, only way it feels like it. Okay, I totally, I totally understand that. A fair, a fair response would be, um, so they want. Can you explain it a different way? You could say, um, I'll, why don't, why don't I try to go over what I said earlier in a different way? And if that still doesn't work, I'll come back with another explanation tomorrow. I want, I want to get more examples for you. It's reasonable to say, let me come up with. If that example doesn't work, let me come up with a better one. Right? Isn't that what we want to do? In what way? I want my students to be able to say, I don't know, but I can. I can like figure it out. Yes. Or, and know how to figure it out. Yes. Well, I want my students to be willing to say to me, that doesn't make sense to me. Help me figure it out. Sure. So I can just model for them. You can model for them. Exactly. I have, this is um, from, do we have any XKCD fans? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, this is an XKCD cartoon. Uh, I, I don't have it in your hand up because I don't have copyright permission. But I'm going to read it out loud to you in case you can't read it in the back. So, handling a student who challenges your expertise with an insightful question. So the instructor, so if the air above the wing travels a longer distance, so it has to go faster to keep up, faster air exerts less pressure, so the wing is lifted upward. I don't even know if that's correct. <laughs> so then you have a student who says, but then why complains fly upside down? Huh. An ideal answer would be, well, that's a good question. Maybe this picture is oversimplified, or it might even be wrong. We should learn more. Um, it's complicated, <laughs> and we need to move on, right? And then really wrong is Sam. <laughs> now, on the 
one hand, that's obviously not something you would do, but I have seen I have seen faculty who make it anxious, get get edgy and a bit irritable, right? I, we, I've been there, maybe you've been there, you're like, I worked so hard to prep this class. Ask questions about what I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes. So this is a fascinating study that just came out of Stanford this summer. Um, Looking at issues of credibility, right? Because there's this notion of fake it till you make it. In fact, that's the title of this article, should you fake it till you make it. And what they found was, in terms of credibility ratings, the people who have the highest credibility are people who present themselves with a lot of confidence, and they're right, not surprisingly, right? The people who then have the next level of, the next range of credibility would be people who are not confident but you find out that they're wrong. That's not so bad if, as long as they were uncertain when they presented the answer. The people who have the lowest credibility are the people who were confident in their answers and then were quickly proven wrong. Does that make sense? The highest credibility is if you know your stuff and you're right. It's actually better then to be uncertain and clear that you're uncertain because if you're wrong, it doesn't hurt you that much. You're a little less credible, but it doesn't hurt you as much as being confident and being wrong. You do now, and it's very hard. And what they showed is it's very hard. You don't get regain that credibility. You, you don't get back up there. So this is a big cost. So I, I just want to let you know that it's much better to say, I, I think this is the right answer. This is my best <coughs> guess. You can educate the guests. You can develop a lot of language around it. Um, now, what was interesting is if you're making a prediction or you're saying something where it's hard to find out the right answer, just go ahead and be confident, <laughs> right? If you're, if you're talking about something where they can't look it up on their computers or their phone right away, go ahead and say what you want, right? Um, because the idea was it took a long time to find out if they were right or wrong. The, cred the confidence didn't affect it. It was only if you could be immediately proven right or wrong. That's something that can be looked up. Now, it might be hard to gauge if it's something to be looked up. But that's where confidence, is, that, is, it, is it helping to fake it till you make it? That's, that's true in uncertainty, like pundits on TV, right? <laughs> they can be really confident because we're not going to know about elections for a couple more weeks. All right. Um, this is really simple, but it's helped me, and hopefully it will help you. If students have questions that stump you in a topic that you don't know, the first thing to do is clarify the question. Generally, students don't ask very clear questions. Grad students more so, but undergrads often are just stumbling around, and they're not quite clear on their question. So to clarify, to ask, are you asking, can you, can you repeat your question? Sometimes you'll know the answer once they get clear. Sometimes it's a simpler question than you thought. Or you might just think of the answer while they're restructuring their question. Acknowledge, this is always a nice thing to do. Thanks for asking that. I, I appreciate you raising that. I've never thought about it that way, right? But you're acknowledging that what they brought was helpful. And people often skip the step when you're nervous and anxious, right? Because you just want to get the answer out to them. And then answer. Now, we've already talked about the confidence part, right? Which you might be lacking. So, we can talk about what, what are phrases you guys like to use when you're not sure of the answer? I don't know. Good. Yes, Steve? It depends. Oh, it depends. <laughs> and that is probably almost always true. It depends on what? It depends on what? Great. Other things, educated guess, um, my best hypothesis, or I'm going to think about this as a psychologist, and here's how psychologists think about this. Anyone in the class now? Good. Other strategies? I wonder if there's been a good article written on that. Nice! I wonder if there's been a good article written on that. This is in your handout. Here, when I was interviewing people, I captured a whole bunch of different ways to say, I don't know, because it can be hard to say that particular three words lots of times in one class. <laughs> um, my favorite, because this is always true, just like it depends, is I believe the literature is mixed on that point. <laughs> That's about as invasive as you can get, and yes, so true, right? <laughs> anyway, so those are some, and you may generate others, but these are nice ways to have in your pocket for ways to, and then the point is, if you don't know, make a little note to yourself after class and go come, come back. I, I heard from instructor after instructor how impressed they were when they were students when the instructor and the teacher would come back because it showed them their question mattered. If you come back the next day and say, someone said, well, Christina asked this question earlier, I didn't know the answer yesterday, but I, I took a look at the research literature, and here's, here's what they had to say. Yes? We're about actively working through the answer with the question. 
Yeah. Very nice. I don't know, but let's just see if we can figure it out based upon what we've done. Very nice, yes. The only tricky part about that when it's outside your expertise is you're not sure if you got to the right answer. But you can then look at it later and come back and say, guys, our analysis of it was perfect, or here's a critical flaw that we made. I like that. That's what we would do with our colleagues. We would think it through, right? We have lots of hypotheses we don't have the answers to. All right, and this is a favorite quote of mine um, from a chemist at um, for Science College. I'll read it. I don't like to read all slides, but you think, what if students discover not perfect? They'll try to be perfect not more. They won't learn better if I'm perfect. They'll learn better if it's uncomfortable actually. That's a really nice. Great. Now, as, as we're wrapping up here, one of the things that Kara asked me to think about is what does this mean for the professor? Right? Um, everywhere I go, almost everyone raises their hand when I ask how many of you have taught outside the direct so, uh, I, don't, I don't have quantitative data, but it's always 90%. Of and I've, I've given this talk in groups of like 500 students. This is very common. Um, so, Take a look at that list of questions. Pick the question that you have the least knowledge on. Okay? Now, find, you know, hopefully, hopefully there's a, maybe there's somebody who's an authority on all four of those, but <laughs> I'm guessing there's at least one where you don't feel like a complete authority. So tell me, if you had, now that you've got your question in mind, if you, not for the purposes of teaching it, but if you just wanted to know the answer to that, how would you find out? Google. Google? <laughs> yes? Yes? Yeah, you would look on the internet, right? I mean, whether you use Bing or whatever, yeah, Google, sure. Um, <laughs> my husband works for Microsoft, so I think I just have to mention Bing. <laughs> um, okay, so you would probably look it up on, your, on the internet. Your students would be, that would be their first, right? If they want to know about white, white food allergies are so common, they're going to look it up. Whether it's Wikipedia or they do a more in depth search. So, there might have been a time, I don't know how far back we would have to go, but there was probably be a time. When if you had one of these questions, you would have knocked on a professor's door, right? Or you would have saved it for class. You would have been like, oh my gosh, I can ask, I can ask about who might have influenced Shakespeare. That's a really good one to ask my professor in class or in office hours. But that's not as likely to happen anymore, right? They might think of something spontaneously, but if they have it when they're just wandering around, they're gonna look it up on their phone, right? Or not. <laughs> they may not, you're right. I mean, I'm distracted the time I can't the I got a text. Exactly, right. But it comes back to this question of what is our role in the classroom? Are, are we, are, we're not Google, right? We, we can't be. <laughs> and that's not what we aspire to be, right? We're not aspiring to be someone who just has every answer we draw for the hat. So, this raises some big questions about some of the, the potential pressure to be teaching on the edge of our expertise to at least get comfortable with it. Because if, if it's not going to be enough to just be someone who knows a lot because, well, I know I have this pot of knowledge and when you ask a question, I'll be able to dip into it. They, they've got a pot of knowledge they can dip into in other places, right? So, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk with the neighbor. You can pick the question that interests you more. Where do we have the most value added in today's classroom? Or how has your very best day of teaching changed? I'm going to take, let's say, three minutes. Talk with the name. Big question, I know. <laughs> so, one of the reasons I wanted to put these two page questions out there is if, if you find yourself noshing in a little bit and you, you, want, you want a big question to gnaw with another person, these are big questions you can play with, right? So you just got into this conversation and you can continue it. So, I'm going to wrap up. When we started, I, I, I said I, there were three questions that I hope you'll have some better answers to. First of all, why do we teach on the edge of our expertise? Why do we find this improvement? Secondly, what are some best practices and common mistakes? So, if we've gotten some best practices from the poise and the confidence and some common mistakes that the strained and anxious do. And then also, what are the implications? And I hope one of the things you've heard from this is that teaching on the edge of your expertise can still be very good teaching. It can be exciting teaching. And I hope that even if you're not there just yet, that you'll someday answer that question about what was my very best day teaching? Like one of my very best day teachings this semester was a day when I was teaching something 
I can just learn. Because I know for myself that sometimes those are the very best days of teaching because I'm really open to hearing what the students have to say. I'm more interested in what they have to say than what I have to say. Because I want because we're building this knowledge together. So I hope someday you'll find yourself saying that as well. Thank you so very much. Yes. Most people, when I when I would ask about that, most people said that in fact they did. In fact, I had one chemistry teacher who did almost exclusively active learning, and then she would move to lecture when it was an uncomfortable topic. Um, and and multiple people, she was the one who was most specific about it because that was her main um, teaching pedagogy, her main her main teaching medium. Um, but a lot of people would say, I'm going to lecture first. And it was interesting. I talked with Eric Major. I don't know if you know his work in physics. He's at Harvard. He does a lot of stuff on peer instruction and active learning. And, and when, when I shared this insight with him that I was hear, hearing this pattern again and again in my interviews that people would lecture, he got so mad. It was so cute. He said, he said, that is, he said, there are lots of reasons to lecture. And that's the worst one I've ever heard. He said, do you know why they're lecturing? because they're still learning the material, and the easiest way to learn the material is to lecture, is to say it out loud. And he's like, that's why I do peer instruction. That's how students learn, is by talking out the material, right? But that's what they're doing for themselves. They're making sure they get it by talking it out. I thought that was such a you know, fascinating way to view this, right? He was, he was like, that's the course excuse for lecture. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm not going to put that in the book. <laughs> yes. Yes, no, but I wonder about that point in terms of yes. you divided your subject group into experience, mm -hmm. less experience. Yes. Did those who have more experience go where Steve went, which said active, oh. would be the way to handle what I don't know. And also, the other question is the yes. discipline matter. And what I wonder is, as you got closer to the humanities, did you move towards more active learners or something else? I haven't parsed the data that way. That's very interesting. I'm trying to think of different examples. Um, I can certainly think of some social scientists who talked about moving to lecture. I'm trying to think of humanities. It's a really good question. So I'm not sure about that. Thank you for asking. It. But in terms of experience, I did hear from people who were very experienced who said they did move to lecture because it was like, OK, I, I, I got control over this. I, I know where we're going to go. <clears throat> Um, one person, one uh, philosophy professor, talked about it like being in a new city. Talked, compared it to being in Venice, which I, I haven't been to Venice, but I guess it's hard to navigate Venice. Anyway, um, anyway, he said he said it would be. He's like it's like if you lecture, it's like holding a map and walking through Venice. Like okay, I know where we're gonna go. Okay, everybody, come with me this way. Yeah, no, no, don't go down that way. Come this way, right? He said as opposed to discussion, it's like I left the map. You know, I've got a couple of points where we want to visit, and I don't have a map. So I thought that was a really interesting analogy that he used. All right, one more. Do you think it's easier to do this in an online format? Ooh, I don't know. That's a great question. Do other people have insights on that? I really don't know. Synchronous or asynchronous? Everyone, yes. Yeah, I was interviewing people in 2008 and 2009, and it wasn't as common to be teaching asynchronous or online at that point, so we didn't talk about that. Thoughts? The people in the room? Yeah. Let's teach you how they actually teach. Sure, that's true. Yes. Learning thing that is like, okay, now we got that and the subject. And the subject matter, yes. Yeah, it's true. If it's if it's in there, don't have got the emails. <laughs> Well, let's take an opportunity to thank Teresa.